Like, Hi, I'm Scott Brady from IdentityServer.com, and I'm joined today by Dominic Bayer from well, one of the authors of Identity Server 4. Um, so today we're going to be talking about what's coming up in Identity Server 4 version 4. Um, Dom, over to you. So last year we had to release version 3 of Identity Server, but you know, because we had to be basically release on the same day as Microsoft releases .NET Core 3, so we yeah. didn't have that, that much freedom of choosing what, what we want to do and when we're going to do it and so on. So version 3, even if it was like a major version number, is really just a really small release, was a really small release, just making sure it's compatible with the latest version of .NET Core. Yep. Um, now we have a little bit more freedom, right, uh, because the next version of .NET will be out end of year. Mm -hmm. So um, probably like mid-year, something June, something like that, uh, we want to release version 4, which is ma ma mainly a feature release. So it will run on the same .NET Core version this time, so nothing changes here, but it's, it's going to have additional features. And, um, you know, basically what we did really is we, we looked at the issue tracker, looked at the backlog, see what, what people were asking for, and um, in the end came up with, I think, four big themes that we wanna wanna do for for the next version, and um, so definitely one thing that was kind of always something we wanted to do but couldn't really because of the whole state of what .NET is in, and that before that, Identity was a .NET standard library, so we had to make it work on all the versions of .NET, and this is gone now. Luckily, it only has to run on .NET Core, so we can now use basically all of the crypto. Yep. libraries that are for .NET Core, which we couldn't do earlier, unless you wanted to start with if defing your way through everything. So um, <clears throat> we started out with the most popular algorithm for signing tokens, which is RSA with SHA-256, which actually is, to be honest, the only mandatory algorithm you have to implement for an OpenD Connect server. Yep. Um, but over time, you know, there were new scenarios, so people wanted to have better signing algorithms uh, and also there's elliptic curves becoming more popular now right so so yeah so uh, one of the big things is now that for the version 4 you can have multiple signing keys so you can um, allow clients which might not be able to deal with the newer versions use the old signing algorithm but the newer ones that you want to you know harden or you know want to meet certain regulations even. Um, they can use different signing algorithms and then you can choose on a per client basis and on a per API basis uh, which of them to use. Which cool. basically gives you a, a nice transition story from, you know, like you, it's not an all or nothing solution. You can start migrating to whatever algorithm you want. Yeah, and it means you can start handling things like um, some of the open banking requirements. Which For is, example, yeah, that, that's yeah. one of the big, biggest driver really. In open banking, they require to use PSS 256 or, yep. or more instead of RSA 256. Mm -hmm. um, while technically we supported that before, but you, we didn't support like having multiple at the same time. So you had to, had to make a hard switch, which yep. means you have to migrate all of your clients, all of your APIs at the same moment in time. So yeah, I think that that'll help, really, that people can step-by-step step migrate yeah. um, their code when they want to. Yeah, and one side effect, I guess, is um, in, in terms of JOTs, especially with, um, with the uh, elliptical curve stuff, much shorter signatures. Shorter signatures, yeah. and I mean, you know, elliptical curves is the future, I guess. I mean, that's, um, um, it's not that widely deployed these days. Uh, some people use it, um, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the main driver was the PSS requirement for, for that feature, but since we were at it, we just enabled everything. And um, yeah, and that's, that's actually, I should say, today uh, we already have a preview version out, which already has that feature. Mm -hmm. So if people want to play around that with today, the documentation has been updated. There's a NuGet package 4.0 preview something out there. So yeah, it's, it's available today already. Cool. Okay, and I guess probably a good one to move on to then is um, the resource indicators. Yes, that's a long story. Yeah, I have to um, <laughs> see. So <clears throat> ultimately, in OAuth, there is no concept of resources, right? So all they have is the scope parameter, yep. and that is a very loosely defined parameter. It basically, says the scope of access, right? And the spec says something like, if you want to have multiple scopes, just you know, 
use these strings, space separate them, the more scopes you have, the more access you have, right? And then the spec also says something like, yeah, and by the way, the, the server might even partially or fully ignore the whole thing, right? So <laughs> that's typical OAuth style. So um, in a previous version of, um, of Identity Server, we completely ignored, so <sighs> the problem is, right, um, in OAuth, there is no concept of resources, but in when, as soon as you use JSON Web Tokens, they have a concept of resources. So strictly speaking, the audience claim in JSON Web Tokens is about the resource, um, but since OAuth doesn't have the resource, we didn't have the resource either, so people were confused now, and JSON Web Token libraries were not working with that, so. Yeah. So we made a decision to implement our own idea of what the resource might be uh, in back in version, you know, like uh, in four. Yeah. Um, but now the good, the good news is that actually there is a spec now which is soon to be finalized, which exactly defines what is a resource and how is the relationship between a resource and the scope. So we're gonna actually change our configuration object model to, to reflect that. Mm -hmm. But I think we found a way to make it look exactly the same if you don't want to have the advanced features, but okay. can, can make it differently if you need that. So, and you know, I mean, maybe I should, um, the whole reason why the resource indicator spec exists is, is that um, if an API, uh, sorry, if a client has access to five APIs, nothing stops the client for asking for a token that can be used at five APIs. And that might be totally fine for a corporate scenario, but maybe, maybe, um, you are asking for two APIs, um, and the two APIs that you talk to don't trust each other, for example. So nothing would stop API one to take the access token from the client and then call API two directly, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. So with the resource indicator spec, you can indicate that you want these resources to be separate, right? So even if the client asks for an access token or access to two APIs, he will get back two access tokens now, one for API 1 and one for API 2, and you know we can't use them anymore to talk to each other. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is maybe you want to introduce resource-specific processing. Maybe you want to have claims in there that should only be available for API 1 okay. and different claims for API 2. Maybe you want to encrypt your tokens, right? Um, you can't just encrypt a token that is used at, at two APIs, otherwise they would need to share key material, right? So yep. all of these things can be formalized with the resource indicator spec, and that's something that PROC actually is working right now. It's yeah. actually a bigger change, as you can imagine, it has a huge ripple effect through every single part of our validation logic and, and so on. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's definitely coming, yeah. Okay, cool.